A lot of people have had their eyes on Assassin's Creed Mirage, and for good reason. Ubisoft, the game's developer and publisher, promises that this will be a return to roots for the franchise. And this has excited a lot of old school fans since recent editions of these games have largely ignored stealth mechanics and instead focused on open world action RPG elements. And while I think Assassin's Creed Origins, Odyssey, and in some ways Valhalla are impressive games for various reasons, many people, including myself, feel that these represent a departure from the core mechanics and stories that made the franchise great to begin with. Exploring vast recreations of ancient cities long since destroyed or forgotten and completing various assassination missions in clever and distinct ways is part of what made us fall in love with the franchise to begin with all those years ago. And so, to hear that Assassin's Creed Mirage aims to return to that original formula, quite obviously, intrigued many of us, to say the very least. Now Ubisoft generously offered me a review code for the game, so I'm here today to discuss what Assassin's Creed Mirage does well and what it does poorly, and perhaps most importantly, what this game represents for the franchise. Did they manage to pull off a classical stealth game? Or does this just feel like a glorified DLC that doesn't actually do anything truly differently from previous titles? In this review, I'm going to give you the clear, concise answers to these questions. But the quick and dirty explanation is that Assassin's Creed Mirage does in fact feel like an Assassin's Creed game of old. Mission designs, encounters, and even the narrative are very reminiscent of those early Assassin's Creed titles. And while it does have its quirks, such as a very basic skill tree that is so uninteresting Interesting, I would have forgotten to apply my skill points had they not put a current tally of skill points on the screen omnipresently when you're playing, and perhaps most frustratingly, enemy AI that occasionally breaks leaving guards standing by themselves doing nothing while you assassinate somebody right next to them. I do have to say that I really enjoyed my time with Assassin's Creed Mirage, and I think old school fans of this franchise will enjoy it as well. It's far from perfect, but for what it is, a budget-priced Assassin's Creed game meant to take you down memory lane, I do think it does a really good job. My only hope is that this release is received well by the public so Ubisoft can greenlight a full production team to take a whack at this formula. I can only imagine what a true AAA or quadruple A budget old school Assassin's Creed game would be like. And after Assassin's Creed Mirage, I'm confident that they could actually pull it off. Now we're gonna get into all of this in this video. Um, I'm not in my regular studio, as you can tell. I'm actually in a hotel room in Orlando, Florida going to Universal Studios and spending time in the Wizarding World and doing the Jurassic Park Velocicoaster and all that stuff. So we're having a great time, but I'm filming this in a hotel room at the resort, and so it's a little janky. Um, furthermore, I'm also losing my voice a little bit. Can you tell we went to Halloween Horror Nights <laughs> with all the scares and stuff? I did go to the Last of Us Haunted House that they have here, which I will make a little Luke Stevens Live clip about explaining my thoughts on that, but it's been a, a wonderful time, a great vacation, but that's why my voice is going, that's why the set is not here, so... Yeah. Anyway, having said that, let's get into it. The first thing that I think should be addressed is how the game actually handles stealth encounters. Does it actually return to old school styles of design? And how does it feel to play in the modern day? Well, the first answer is an unequivocal yes. There are some missions later in the story that feel like they were copy and pasted directly from the original game or from one of the subsequent releases, whether that be Brotherhood or even something like AC3. They even have a couple of throwback missions through the main story where you'll be tasked tasked with tailing an enemy target. These were so common back in the old days of Assassin's Creed, such as in AC4 Black Flag or even Assassin's Creed Unity, that they became a meme, commonly mocked, that you had to tail all of these targets, slowly walking behind them, trying to stay within an arbitrary range to be able to hear what they were talking about. But in the age of the mind-numbing hack-and-slash missions of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I actually found myself chuckling when tasked with these trailing missions. It just goes to show you that players Players can tolerate less than stellar mission design so long as they're done in moderation and in a greater context of other missions that are more or less engaging. 
Not to mention that simply as a callback to old school Assassin's Creed games, I thought this was a funny inclusion. The core design of the gameplay loop is also very reminiscent of those old school games. Your goal is to take down the order within Baghdad, and you do this by taking down secondary targets underneath the overarching leader of the group that controls the city. In order to take down these secondary targets, you gain new intel and complete secondary and tertiary objectives, such as investigating kidnappings, helping retrieve someone's stolen goods, speaking with merchants in a bazaar to find out what you need to get access to one of the aforementioned targets, or at least get closer to them, and so on and so forth. It's nothing revolutionary or new, but it does work quite well when consumed and approached as a broad guideline for the player. In addition, the opening sections of the game are handled really well. Seeing the origin story of Bassam was cool, and I thought they handled it pretty well. My only complaint would be that the prologue feels pretty rushed, and I think that they could have taken more time to establish his life before he became an assassin. There are also a handful of tie-ins to other Assassin's Creed games, and more specifically Assassin's Creed Valhalla. That's of course where we first met Basim, and while I detest that game in a lot of ways, I did think that this was cool, and I won't go into spoilers for obvious reasons, but I will say that there are a couple of interesting ways that they tie Mirage to Valhalla, which I think makes it feel like a more cohesive story. After actually becoming an assassin, you will be taking down targets and completing investigations with stealth as your primary tactic. Melee combat is an option, but it's clearly discreet. Discouraged. You have a light and heavy attack which are controlled by the same button, and then a basic parry that can be used on specific attacks coming from enemies that have lighter weapons. It is clearly a dumbed down version of the melee combat system we saw in Valhalla, which some people might look at as a downgrade, but I'm actually glad that they walked melee really far back this time around, because it discourages you from using melee to get out of sticky situations, instead relying on stealth, which is, after all, the very point of this game. To to complete these stealth encounters, you will be using your typical hidden blade assassination, paired with tools that can be unlocked in whichever order you prefer based on your playstyle. A point of warning, I would actually hazard against using the smoke bombs early in the game because they are incredibly overpowered, basically constituting an easy mode as far as I can tell. Similarly, you will also gain access to a supercharged assassination ability that lets you warp between targets quickly. This is something we saw in the gameplay trailer a few months ago which raised some red flags, and having played the game I can say that it is a tool available to the player relatively early on, but you do not need to use it to complete the missions that they throw at you. After the initial tutorial sequence explaining how it worked, I basically didn't touch it again for the rest of the game. And this was because I personally found it pretty immersion breaking. And it comes off as granting Basim a supernatural ability, which I don't like in these games. I prefer them to be a little bit more grounded. But of course, this is personal preference and you might not care about it. With that being said, when you actually go through the motions of completing missions and assassinating targets, you will be surprised at just how fluid the gameplay loop can feel. The levels are also pretty carefully designed. There's almost most always multiple points of entry, and while it isn't quite on the level of something like Assassin's Creed Unity in terms of variability of options, it's still pretty good. Some missions are certainly better than others, but I was always pleasantly surprised when I had two or three different options for luring out a target or entering the space where they resided. My biggest frustration in the gameplay department, however, is the AI of the enemies patrolling these bases. They would often have moments of pretty impressive intelligence, such as spotting me in the rafters when they were stretching their back, which led to their cone of vision leaning up towards the ceiling and in turn spotting me. I thought that was really cool when I saw it happen, and I wasn't even upset about being spotted, I just thought that that was a cool thing that happened. But at other times I would assassinate somebody with, say, a throwing knife that was standing within arm's length of another guard, and that other guard would have no reaction whatsoever, simply standing there like nothing had happened. This immediately made me think that there was some problem with the AI's detection of events happening around them. There is a sound and noise system in the game, so certain actions that the player can engage in can alert enemies to their presence simply based off of the noise produced, so it seems to me that this guard should be able to tell that something was going on when he heard the thud of his friend collapsing next to him. Him. There are some outfits that you can equip to get certain perks, and then they can be upgraded further to grant further improved abilities, such as an early game outfit, which when upgraded, allows you to reduce the sound made during assassinations by up to 100% meaning that assassinations will then be silent, meaning no enemies will be alerted if they can't see you. However, this doesn't apply in this particular case. Not only was my outfit not fully upgraded, but I was also using throwing knives which are not included in the description of the ability. If this just reduces the sound produced by all damaging attacks, then they should say that, 
and that could perhaps explain why the guard wasn't alerted, but it sure just felt like the AI wasn't working properly. And this is compounded with a handful of other occasions while playing the game when guards didn't seem to react the way I thought they would. Even in cases of direct melee confrontation, there were a handful of times when guards would simply stop fighting and just stand there. It's like there was some trigger that went off incorrectly that turned off their aggression so they are still engaged in combat, but they just aren't doing anything. They just stand there and wait for you to kill them. The good thing is that I'm confident this can be patched out, and I'm hoping that calling it out here will expedite that process. Who knows, in a week or two after this video goes up, or perhaps even in the day one patch, this could be totally remedied and no longer an issue. And like I said, this was something I only ran into occasionally, and it was not what I would consider to be a super common thing. It happened once every hour and a half to two hours. Moving on, the recreation of the city of Baghdad is also really impressive, with tightly packed streets, very dense crowds filling every alleyway, and colorful foliage, spices, and clothing sprinkled about. I was worried that it would feel very samey given the style of architecture, but they actually did a really good job of crafting a city that feels lived in and believable while also being fun to explore and navigate. The one part of the map where this really falls flat, though, is in the outskirts of the surrounding city. There are a couple of oases, a couple of enemy encampments hidden within some sand dunes, and then a couple of military encampments as well along waterways, but all told, that's really all there is. It's pretty clear that most of the dev time went into the city, which I think is totally, totally fair. After all, once again, this is a budget game released at a lower price and developed by a smaller team on a lower budget. It would be unfair to expect them to come out swinging with something the size of AC Odyssey or Valhalla, and I don't think many of us would even want that. This is a leaner game, and I actually think that's one of its strengths, because by the time you've put 20 to 25 hours in, you've likely seen all that Mirage has to offer, which I think is actually pretty refreshing when paired with the reduced price. And speaking of price, I think I should also mention the in-game store, which drew some ire over the summer when it was leaked that it would be in the game. I can say that the store is here present in the game, and the pricing of some of these packs is at very best highly highly aggressive. Furthermore, they're also selling things like a map pack that places all treasures, chests, and points of interest on your map expediting completionist runs. Now, Personally, I don't like these. Most of you probably don't like these microtransactions, but at the very least, we can say that they aren't mandatory, and if you don't like them, you don't have to pay for them. The one spot where they do start to get into the problematic realm is when they have gameplay effects, which outfits and weapons do in fact have in AC Mirage. For example, the Sands of Time pack that comes with the deluxe edition of the game does have some pretty powerful perks and abilities tied to it, but I wouldn't personally consider them game-breaking. But they do certainly affect gameplay, and I could see some people using these to create builds that could be pretty powerful when paired with the skill tree and certain improvements and upgrades that can be made to tools like throwing knives and smoke bombs. On a positive note, if you do truly like the cosmetic aspect of one item but you want the perk of another, you can go to blacksmiths and armor in the city and pay them to transmog items for you, something I consider to be a win-win since you can get the gameplay effect you want and the cosmetic aspect that you want as well. But going back to the core point, I don't like these in-game stores and I wish they weren't here. But this is honestly pretty far down the list of Ubisoft in-game store offenses. But I do feel like I should bring your attention to it in case you were curious or saw the news that leaked earlier this year about these in-game stores. Shifting gears into the narrative, this does feel like an old-school Assassin's Creed game in terms of its story, but it does really lack unique and memorable characters. Whether you look back at Assassin's Creed 2 or even something like Unity, you will realize how many colorful characters there were in those stories. This time around though, it's like everybody has the flu. Everyone just stands around scowling and grunting to each other, and while I can appreciate the commitment to gritty stories with high stakes and people's lives on the line, I do think that there's a way to tell those stories with intermixed moments of levity and characters that aren't so one-dimensional. I think they were aware of this early on, but as production progressed, they lost sight of it. Since the opening sections of the game have such moments of levity, but as you play the game and the later in the game you go, the more dry the story gets. There are some cute side encounters and missions that offered a little bit of levity to the non-stop grind that is the main story. But all that to say, I think the story is serviceable. As for Basim specifically, after playing the entire game, I don't think he even approaches my top five favorite protagonists in the franchise. I'm not really itching to see him in a sequel or anything else, and personally I just find him to be 
relatively boring compared to other protagonists that we've gotten to enjoy over the last 15 years or so. However, to summarize the narrative, I think it does the job of justifying the gameplay missions that you'll be engaging with over the course of its runtime. It's not going to change your life or cause any serious introspection, but it does the job that a video game narrative should do at the very least. And lastly, as for performance, I played on PC, so console performance may vary, but I had little to no issues from start to finish. I even played a good amount on my ROG Ally, and it performed great there as well. This was honestly pretty refreshing since AC Valhalla launched with a ton of bugs, including one where Ivor was perpetually drunk every time you loaded in, a bug which, mind you, took months for them to fix, and there were also other issues like terrible screen tearing on the Xbox port of the game. But in AC Mirage, I could count on a single hand all of the things I could possibly count as bugs, and even then a lot of them I'm not sure actually were bugs. Put very, very simply, I think they actually delivered a really polished game, and based on my experience, I think this is one of the most polished games from Ubisoft that I've played in the last five years. I'm really happy to report that it seems like Ubisoft is actually prioritizing polish as far as I can tell, and it seems that those delays of this game were not, in fact, wasted. This actually really increases my hope for games like Avatar and Star Wars Outlaws, since it seems like Ubisoft is, in fact, capable of shipping polished games after all. But all told, I've been really impressed with AC Mirage. In my view, it did everything it needed to do. It delivered a lean, mean Assassin's Creed experience at a smaller budget on a smaller scale that's approachable for new fans and old. And while it's not going to win any Game of the Year awards, while it's not going to blow anybody away or anything, it's good. And that's more than can be said for a lot of games nowadays. Whether you want to pay the full 50 bucks up front to get access to the game on something like Steam or Xbox, or if you just want to sign up for the Ubisoft Plus, whatever it's called this week, to get access to it for like 18 bucks for the entire month, I think it's worth checking out if you're a fan of these old school Assassin's Creed games. And while it's far from a masterpiece or anything like that, I think it did the job it set out to do, which was deliver a fun little romp in the Assassin's Creed hay, and to give old school fans like me and a lot of you a trip down memory lane, and in that capacity, I think it succeeded. But with that, thank you for watching. I love you all dearly. I will be back in my regular studio soon. And then like the next day, after I'm back, we close on a house, and then we're gonna be moving the whole studio into that new house, which is gonna be crazy. So um, we'll, we'll vlog it. We'll do all of that on the live channel. Again, look up Luke Stevens Live in the search bar, and you can join me live when we're streaming and see a bunch of content that doesn't make it onto this channel. So uh, yeah, do that. But I'm gonna call it there. My voice is going out, as you can probably hear, so I'm going to stop plaguing you with the responsibility of listening to my vocal cords fry, so I'm gonna call it there. Thank you for watching. I love you all dearly, and I'll see you in the next one. Hugs and kisses. Bye bye